where reality collides with truth. There are no limits. There are no boundaries. This is all planning and reality. This will not be TV. This is actually an audio podcast. Our faces are taking a break from video right now. Thanks to all of you out there who continue to listen, support, exhort, and keep us moving. We're kind of getting back on track after the strange energies of a previous week where, well, obviously we just have this massive thing going on on the West Coast where two of the people on this call tonight are. And uh, we here on the East Coast have our own issues and problems. Extreme weather last week on both coasts, fire on the West, and this weird snowstorm that hit the East. It's just like laid in here and pounded us with snow and gridlocked the entire uh, Eastern East Coast from Washington, D.C., the whole way to New York City. So very strange stuff going on with weather, strange occurrences with uh, violence and odd fires. We're going to talk about all of that. I will introduce you and turn you over to my co-host, Emily Moyer. <laughs> Emily, hey. Hey, good to be back. Uh, good to be back, guys. And it's uh, interesting to not be on camera. Usually when I'm saying that, I'm like looking at the screen. It's kind of weird. But anyway, welcome back. And yeah, we had an unexpected week off last week with all the kind of chaos and stuff that was going on over here. And uh, before we get started, I just uh, really actually wanted to thank um, all of the patrons. We are having... Um, we're having a, a lot of growth right now in a really good month. And thank you to all of those who have supported us from the very beginning and the people who've just come along recently. We really, really appreciate it from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you so much. And um, now we're going to get on with the show and we have a returning guest tonight who is always fascinating. And so we're going to dig into some of her newsletters. We're going to talk about the preceptron unseeable space going for it, war of the world, schisms and fractals and the passing peak of knowledge with Miss Sophia Smallstorm. And in the second hour, we're going to just get into the general chaos that's going on with her. But Sophia, welcome back to Off Planet Radio. Nice to see you again. You can't see me. It's only okay. audio. It is. <laughs> you know what I mean. But we're seeing you too. It's it's yeah. uh, it's we're a both remote connection viewers, thing. Sophia, so you can't hide from us. <laughs> no, I get it. And you know, to see Randy and Emily with a capital S means to know. Yep. Ah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah so yeah. when you see with a capital S, you really see into something so you're seeing into me and that's fine thank you well you know part of this uh, medium that we work in sometimes i find the video to be a distraction other times i think it's useful but i also think it's nice to go back to voices because our energetics carry in our voices and we we hear we listen we aren't we aren't sitting here with our heads bobbing and, and looking around, we're, we're, we're connecting on what I consider to be a, a fairly intimate level with the human voice, and that's really important to sometimes just, just go for that connection. Randy, may I just throw in a little bit of a sidetrack? Absolutely. Right we're all about the sidetrack here. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I don't think, in my gut, I know that we were designed to be listening to each other's voices. And I'll tell you why. Before electrification of our world, we lived in the dark yes. when it was dark, right? And we had a few candles, maybe we had a fire, but that neither of those gave off a whole lot of light. And we really just retired when it got dark. And sleep, I learned, is biphasic, meaning that you go into one phase of sleep for several hours, that's the natural way of things. And then you'll wake up and you'll, um, you know, in the old days, old, old, people used to get up and they'd go out in the moonlight and they'd eat something from the trees, the fruit, they'd talk or they'd stay in if it was cold and they'd be huddled in their whatever, cottage or hovel or whatever it was. And they'd, they'd talk for yeah. a while and yes. then they'd go back to sleep for phase two, the phase, the second phase of sleep. 
and they'd wake up when it was light. So I believe that we are designed to listen to each other's voices in the dark. And the telephone and these audio exchanges over the computer really supply that. And we know how to intuit through what we're getting in terms of sound. And we can feel what the person is saying. So we're very good at this. And when you have the video with it, it's just like, People are jowly and disgusting looking on video, <laughs> computer video. You know, but you bring up an interesting point, Sophia, and it's largely even centered around these, the oral tradition and how we transmitted our history, our lore, our own energetic footprint was kind of inscribed into the into the human voice and as you're saying talking in the middle of the night you know i used to do late night radio shows and i can remember i love being in a darkened i'm actually in a darkened room right now you know there's a little bit of ambient light here but the the concept of leaning in and talking to people in a darkened room, there's just something so romantic about that, especially for an old radio guy. So um, we're losing that. We're losing that to the pollution and distraction of video, which we'll continue to use here because it is useful, but uh, I'm really digging the voice thing. Yes, Randy, and we're losing it to pigeon texting, P-I-D-G-I-N. Wow, there's a there's a concept. Mm. To explain pigeon that. texting. Yeah, pigeon. You know what pigeon is? When they say pigeon English, it means a very kind of bastardized, truncated form of speaking yeah. English right, right. Pigeon yeah, okay. in any language. And texting is a pigeon form of communicating. Yeah. I heart you. Come on. Right. Well, I do. I. I. You know. That the, there's obviously a an agenda to reduce the length, like the size of the language, you know, for, of people, right? Like if people don't have like words for something, they can't have that experience. And so there's nothing that the controllers would love more than to just provide, you know, a few texting phrases and, you know, 27, you know, emoji, emoticons or emojis and have that be the expanse of what people can imagine for an experience. Right. Right, and this is the perfect segue into the subject of the first hour of the show. Yeah, absolutely. So you have, you know, for people who uh, receive Sophia's newsletter, and if you don't, you should. So head on over to uh, her website and uh, subscribe to that. But um, we're going to be looking at her uh, July 2018 newsletter. And what Um, is that website, by the way? Let's get Get it, the out. best way to reach it is sophiasmallstorm.com, Sophia with an F. And there's a little tab on the left that you can click, and it shows you some sample newsletters. I really owe it to my visitors to put up some more recent ones, because but they're still good, the ones I have there. And, you know, to get my newsletter, you have to uh, send me uh, whatever the minimum subscription is. It's $50 donation a year, and... You do it by snail mail, so you can't really sign up. A lot of people think you can Ah. sign up on the website, but it's by subscription, and um, I love to get to know my readers. It's not like I have a giant list, but I have a list of very loyal people. Some of them have stayed with me since 2010 when I started this, and if you can believe it, I have to churn out a newsletter every month. Some months I do double issues, like this month I'm so deep into a subject that I'm having to make it a double issue but it's a chatty newsletter don't think you're going to get you know regurgitations of recent stuff on the internet that is not what my newsletter is about it is from my own heart and my own kind of whirlwind mind and thinking process Emily you say what it's about all right tell them Her newsletter is really interesting. I mean, it's like having a conversation with you, Sophia, which I'm fortunate enough to have more conversations with you than most people will ever get to have. But, you know, you start somewhere with an idea and then you sort of wander off into all of these fantastic little crevices of your mind that all house very interesting, you know, sort of ideas and structures and thoughts and whatever in them. And it's kind of like I always imagine 
you know, I think I said this the first time we did a show together that like, you know, I like to go rabbit hole diving with Sophia Smallstorm. I imagine that if you get down to like the very, very, very bottom of the rabbit hole and spelunk over a few spaces, Sophia has like a, uh, you know, a tea parlor or something down there where you can go and have strange conversations with her. And that's what the newsletters are like. <laughs> that's a good description. Yeah, it's like a tea parlor, one-way conversation, but I am imagining that the reader is answering in his or her mind. So I always write for the reader. Yep, they're very entertaining. They're easy to, I mean, sometimes I look at one, I'm like, okay, this is pretty lengthy. But before I know it, I'm through it in, you know, 30 minutes or something like that when I thought, oh, this is going to take a while. You know what I mean? Sometimes less, sometimes 15 or 20 minutes because it's so interesting. And I'm a fairly fast reader. So interesting. You can't put it down. And there you are. You're all done. Um, And then I read it again. (laughs) Well, you're very, uh, very kind. But yeah, yeah, so the July newsletter, you know, a lot of times the newsletter is prompted by something that happens to me or something that I do. And that's where I start because I know that by going into that, I can go into a lot of other things. And I saw this movie. It was on the Turner Network, um, Turner Classic Movies, and it was called Desk Set, which is a really bad... Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. Yeah. Terrible title for this movie, Desk Set. I mean, what is a desk set? It's some crap that you have on your desk, you know? But this movie was really about a supercomputer of the time. So it turns out that the computer in the movie was really based on the computer called ENIAC, E-N-I-A-C. Now, Randy, you are, you, this is your, your uh, rabbit hole. So you can talk anytime you want to, but ENIAC was the world's first general purpose electronic computer or one of them and it's an acronym for electronic numerical integrator and computer e-n-i-a-c it was financed by the army the u.s army and it cost about half a million dollars at the time which was 1943 and that is the equivalent of six or seven million dollars today so the work began on ENIAC in secret at university of pennsylvania And three years later, it was unveiled to the public, and the media called it the giant brain. Now, ENIAC was a thousand times faster than other electromechanical machines. And also, it was able to (laughs) exceed humans' best efforts in a matter of seconds. So, for a particular calculation, it would take 2,400 human hours to get to the answer. And ENIAC took half a minute for the same calculation. So, Randy, had you ever heard of ENIAC? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, We actually, when I was in high school, got a hold of one of these computers that the uh, one of the um, military depots had dumped off and played around with them. This was in the 70s. And um, those computers, by today's standards, are barely computers at all. Um, But they were capable of doing routine mathematical tasks in a very high-order way that enabled them to basically outstrip the human capacity for calculations at that level. You know, there's a... And as we go through this subject tonight, we'll see that there's misperceptions about comparing machine machine capabilities with human capabilities. But it's important to note that this was, on the record, it was supposedly the first, it was actually the first general purpose computer. It was computational computer, but it was it had programming capabilities for doing other types of computing besides computational. A lot of people don't realize that um, the forerunner to this were actually the computers that were being run off of these um, card systems in Nazi Germany during World War II in the strategic alliance between IBM and the Third Reich. So the computer age actually began in Nazi Germany. Right. And it was back then, I think it was in 
the 40s and then the 50s that they started to presume that human thought could be mechanized. And mathematicians in the 40s, along with engineers and psychologists, economists, lots of different kinds of specialists began to talk about the possibility of the artificial brain, or they called it the thinking machine. So at the time, as I wrote in my newsletter, neurology was showing us that the real brain, the human brain, was a network of neurons that fired electrical pulses. And I've since learned so much about bioelectricity. I actually now call it electronic biology. It is absolutely amazing how how much we are sensory, <clears throat> sentient or sentient, I don't know how it's said, beings based on electricity. That's mm-hmm. really our core. But anyway, so with all this electrical pulse you know, theory, or not theory, but proof to the working of the human brain. These these specialists, professionals, whatever you want to call them, scientists decided that it was possible, it would be possible to design a thinking machine. And one of those inventions was the preceptron, And it was abandoned for a short time, but is once again now the focus Uh of the industry. Randy, do you know, can you tell us about that? I actually don't know that much generally about the perceptron. This was kind of uh, your research that that brought this up. I'm not overly familiar with it. Well, what I know is that the perceptron was the creation of this guy, Frank Rosenblatt, who was at Cornell, and it was 1957. Of course, you know, the Navy funds all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Navy is phenomenally interested in the correlations between biology and computation, biology and science. And um, the perceptron was designed for image recognition, but it didn't do a great job at that because it seemed to miss a bunch of types of patterns. But it was really powerful at what they call connectionistic algorithms. And I really don't Mm -hmm. understand what that is. It was too much brain crunching when I started looking it up. So all I can tell you is that today, the foundation of the perceptron is what powers the kinds of computers we're working with, or AI, you could say. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this book, I bought a book called New Dark Age. It's written by James Bridle. He's an Englishman. And what I got from reading that book and reading an overview of that book was that Machine thought, if you want to call it that, or you could call it computation or supercomputation, it really operates beyond human understanding. And it machines model, they create their own version of meaning. And they do it in their own machine language. And it doesn't match ours whatsoever. It, these are neural networks. So we have our own neurological network. But machines have their type of neural network and they build their own models of the data based on the data they're being given. They will create their own meanings from the data that they're fed and they will have their own particular, it's called mesh of meaning. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I'll just say this, but the machine Mesh is multidimensional. It extends in more directions than the human mind can even conceive. So what that translates to is this, that the space in which machines learn and create meaning is unseeable to us. And I'll let you comment, Randy. Machine learning and machine intelligence is based at any given time 
on the perceptual frameworks that were fleshed out going back into the early 1950s. Um, the earliest machines were strictly computational machines, very essentially very fast calculators. The early Texas Instrument calculators were actually faster than the the uh, ENIAC computer or its uh, later model, which I think was the EMERAC. But what was really, if the, the, the turning point came in 1950 with a man named Alan Turing who, who published a paper in which he began to devise what was called the Turing test. And it was based on the premise that a machine could carry on a conversation with a human being. Now, obviously, it was being done over a teleprinter or what we would know or what not. The next generation doesn't remember this dot matrix printers, but basically that's what a teleprinter was. It was like a, a, a high speed mm -hmm. typewriter. And so Turing devised the basic test that the computer would be able to convincingly engage conversation with a human being. So that was the earliest gauntlet that was laid down. And, you know, when you look at the history of this, you realize that this was, again, like all of these types of development lines being done across many different projects, many different universities, both in the U.S., um, post-World War II, England was already beginning to amass computational abilities. This was the beginning of the digital revolution then. And it's, it's important to bear in mind that their definitions of machine learning are always and still are even as we're on the verge of this quantum revolution, still based on binary models, meaning that the machine itself extrapolates everything from a binary base code. And as we go through this, I, I'm, I'm hoping I can make the case that as human beings, even though we have neural networks and even though we are electrical we're operating on electrical impulses inside of our brains. There's something else behind us that a machine can't simulate. And so hopefully that'll kind of be, that's where my thinking has gone on this. Because I was supposed to go to Denmark in September to present on artificial intelligence. And I had done a lot of research on it and I had built the basic structure for the talk. But unfortunately that, that conference was canceled due to financial issues so I'm very interested in the subject but I think you know from another uh, standpoint Sophia you're building something here that's a, a, a wider sweep of some things we need to think about as we go into this next level which in my opinion is this quantum era so Randy what do you remember Gary Kasparov yes Kasparov yep and he played the supercomputer Deep IBM Blue. IBM Blue, yep. Right, by IBM. So Deep Blue was able to analyze 200 million board positions per second. Mm -hmm. And Kasparov couldn't do that. And therefore, when Deep Blue made its moves, even though it was operating on binary input and in a binary way, it was able to operate so fast that Kasparov could not keep up with those statistics mm -hmm. and probabilities. So I then read in this book, New Dark Age, about a board game called Go, yeah. which I hadn't heard of. But Go is the oldest uh, board game possibly in the world. Right. It was invented. Sorry? Yeah, it was. Uh, um, I think it came out of China. Right. China in antiquity, and it's mostly played by people from East Asia. So it was counted as an essential art by the Chinese aristocrats. And you might have seen, I know I've seen in antique shops, these squat little wooden tables, and they have a grid of boxes on them. And you play Go with these black and white stones. And really, Go could be called, it, it derives from the Japanese word ego, I-G-O, 
which comes from Middle Chinese and translates to the encircling game. So you can place your stones or your plain pieces anywhere on the board, but your opponent is able to then surround that stone and remove it. And once again, you have to think of all these different board positions. And so it's a game of patience, time, and a very, very big mind. And so this company called DeepMind Technologies made a computer program called AlphaGo. And that computer program was able to play the board game Go, right? And Google, of course, bought DeepMind Technologies and AlphaGo, but AlphaGo in 2016 beat a Go, which is the game, Go world champion. His name was Lee Si Dahl. He was from South Korea. And I'm going to read this from, from New Dark Age. By 2016, when Google's AlphaGo software defeated Lee Si Dahl, one of the highest ranked Go players in the world, something crucial had changed. In their second game, AlphaGo stunned Si Dahl and spectators by placing one of its stones on the far side of the board, seeming to abandon the battle in progress. Fan Hui, another professional Go player watching the game, was initially mystified. He later commented, it's not a human move. I've never seen a human play this move. He added, so beautiful. Nobody in the history of the 2,500 year old game had ever played in such a fashion. AlphaGo went on to win the game and the five match series. So what that takes us to is the fact that not only was AlphaGo trained, developed, it's a software, remember, by being fed millions of moves by expert Go players, and then it played itself millions and millions of times, and it learned all kinds of new strategies that completely overtook anything human beings could do. But what I concluded was that the ability of AlphaGo to make a move that was just completely out of human computation, like to put a piece on the far edge of the board and to have already worked out the strategy that would lead to victory based on that move, it tells me that not only does this kind of computation go beyond human understanding, but the machine has the big picture figured out. And that's when I realized that this is how the global agenda is taking place at such an accelerated rate. All this data analysis and fielding and gathering and harnessing, thanks to us, because we're feeding all our data into computers and networks and systems. Mm -hmm. And those networks are grabbing all these bits and pieces of data, and because they can compute as well as they can and as fast as they can and as, with billions and billions of bits that we cannot even keep up with, they know when to do this, when to do that, what it's going to create in the public's response because they are that far ahead of us on the big picture. So um, as I'm sitting here listening to you guys talk, I'm having like a couple of thoughts and I'm going to do my best to sort of explain this clearly but like what I keep getting is that the machine can just do more stuff and f stuff faster it can't actually do any like so because it can do more and faster and you know sort of go further and further out with what it, where it's taking an idea quick quicker it seems like the idea might be unique but from <clears throat> at least from where I sit and what I've observed with technology is it, it doesn't have the capacity for unique thinking that humans do. And so what you're talking about when you're saying that they're gathering up data, sure, they're doing that. But there's also, like, I guarantee you that the people who are building these technologies and on a certain level even the technology itself, because I do think that there's a level of uh, – you know, consciousness or, or uh, dare I even say some kind of like, you know, 
artificial sentience or something that these machines are attaining that are particularly interested in unique thinking individuals, say somebody like yourself, or maybe someone like Randy or someone like me, right? And, and I, you know, they're observing the, the, the way that you, we think, and then they are allowing the machine to then take that farther. But if they don't have an interesting human to base that on, so you talked about connection algorithms, right? So I had something interesting. Well, let me see how the best way to describe this is. Like, Sophia, you're familiar with some of the sort of uh, invasive technologies like voice to skull and uh, monitoring of people's, you know, brain frequencies and all that kind of stuff that, that, that's going on, right? So I had a particular, and I maybe have talked about this on the show before, but I had a particular period in my life where I was receiving a lot of this kind of intrusion. And what would sort of happen is while I was sleeping, I would find myself like suddenly being sort of, it was like I was doing some kind of uh, a mental, like uh, it was like a obstacle course that involved like intellect and doing things like Sudoku, but also a certain like level of almost like a uh, capoeira, but with words and language and ideas and geometry and shapes. It was like kind of crazy, right? Like it was in the dream space, but it felt very real, right? It was like uh, I was going through some kind of test, right? And sometimes I would feel like, uh, um, you know, when you um, go to clean the files in your computer and on the box in the lower right side, you'll see all the le letters and numbers running across really fast, right? Until it's kind of gone through all the files and tells you it's clean or it's found the file it's looking for. Sometimes it would feel like some of this stuff was going through my mind really quickly like this. And then when this was over, so I would not, I'd wake up not feeling like I had slept. I'd wake up feeling like I had been run through some kind of strange mental gymnastics obstacle course of all this kind of stuff. But I remember very clearly hearing in my head, <clears throat> uh, you're the, um, thank you for, wait, wait, wait. they said th the files have been, thank you. For, the files have been transferred. Thank you for your insights. Something like that. Right. The files have been transferred. Thank you for your insight. I think what they're really interested in is looking at someone who's an interesting thinker, right. Putting stuff in front of them, seeing what your response is to that, not just the general public, right. Like the general public, sure, they want, like that's what's going on on Facebook and whatever. But they're actually able, through other kinds of technologies, to dig into fascinating people's minds and see the way you work stuff out. See where you might go with something, right? See what one thing might make you, make you think of next. And then they feed that information into the machine. So that information is not just having, you know, th that machine is not just having the data of, you know, 300 million average Americans, but it's having the brain power of Sophia Smallstorm behind it. And then it can do it faster and more. So it can almost get ahead of you with your own thinking. I had something happen a few weeks ago when I haven't even told Randy about this, right? We were recording a show, just a simple a short podcast, he and I, and he started talking about dreams and, and then he got into talking about memory, right? And I'm sitting here listening to him. And for some reason in my head, it triggered oh, we should talk to Mary Lou Henner sometime. Because Mary Lou Henner is one of these people that has uh, the perfect memory, right? Like she can tell you what happened at like 11.53 a.m. on November 2nd, 1953, you know, in uh, Topeka, Kansas, right? And I just had the thought in my head. I didn't say it to Randy. I never, Randy, have I ever said anything about that to you? Randy, you there? You're muted. I can't hear you. Are you there, Randy? No, I've never, never No, sorry. Yeah, I, I didn't was, say I anything. He's out. sitting there. He's talking about memories. For some reason, it made me think of Mary Lou Henner, right? And the reason I know this about Mary Lou Henner is because she used to be on a television show that my cousin wrote for. So I knew that about her from then. And then many years later, which was now several years back now, I also heard her interviewed about, about this, like on the Alex Jones show, like maybe five or seven years ago, right? But I hadn't thought about it since then. And for some reason... Rand, something Randy said about memory made me think of that, right? Made me think of that. I didn't say a word, didn't talk about it to anybody, didn't write anything down, didn't type anything on my computer, didn't do any searches. The very next day, my YouTube feeds me in the recommended section an interview with Mary Lou Henner about her memory. Yeah. Right? Like that quickly. 
Okay. And I, I didn't say anything. So, you know, that's the level that we're getting to, but it, I don't think it's just, you know, this compilation of all the random data. I think they're really interested in, in, in particularly unique thinkers, like someone like yourself, maybe even someone like me or someone like Randy. And they need those brains to power these machines to make them be able to do stuff like that. They can do better, bigger, better, faster, more, but they can't actually come up with a unique way of thinking. I agree with you, Emily, but how, I mean, if you just had this thought in your head, then how did they access that thought? I've so, actually had the same experience. And it was, yeah. um, this is kind of mundane, but uh, in October, I was detailing the inside of my car, and I was looking at a leather, one of my leather seats, and my car is an older car now, and there's some wear spots on the leather seat on the driver's side from me getting in and out of it every day. And in my head, I thought, looking at it, hmm, somebody must make a repair kit for leather. Now, I didn't talk, I didn't speak this out loud. I didn't say anything to anyone. I didn't Google search it. I didn't look it up. Two or three days later, I'm on Instagram of all places, and what pops up but an ad for leather repair kits. Get one now. Three kits, only $45.99. And, you know, you click on the ad and you look at it, and I'm like, that's creepy. So I, I think that some of these, so I don't think they're doing this to every single person out there, right? But they're doing this to unique thinkers or to people who are aware of this technology that they want you to know the technology and the people controlling it want you to know that they know that, you know, all that kind of stuff. Right. Like, you know, there's, um, I mean, we've all had that experience obviously where we talk about something out loud and then we get ads for it or whatever. I had something very strange happen to me one time. I was, I, I was, had a dream about my friend, uh, that I hadn't talked to in a long time. And in the dream, it was like I was trying to find her in a shopping mall somewhere, right? And I finally found her in this store that looked kind of like Sephora. You know the cosmetic store Sephora, Sophia? Yeah. Okay, so it looked sort of like that, but instead of having makeup, it had jewelry. But it was like, kind of looked like that inside. And when I saw her, she was missing a tooth, right? The next day, I wake up, I look at Facebook. The first thing that pops up is a post from her. I hadn't talked to her in years at this point. A post from her, and it says, I got my tooth fixed today, right? And then in the little ad space to the right, there was an ad for this store called Pandora, which is a jewelry store for young girls that is owned by the same people as Sephora. Well, you guys live in the twilight zone. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I got to admit that the the you know the leather repair kit falls into the realm of the mundane. It's the occurrence itself that's kind of disconcerting because I literally didn't do any more than it was a passing thought. So, Sophia, you it has ne never crossed your mind that these fools pay attention to your work and then they go about using that and how they plan their next stuff. Come on, Sophia. <laughs> Well, okay. I don't think I'm that that important. Or I mean, I would say yes. I'm probably unique in that. Mm -hmm. It's about unique. Else. It's not that important. It's about how you. They're interested in unique insight, right? That's what the voice told me. We're interested in your insights. When you look at something, Sophia, you see something in a very different way than the average person. Maybe an even maybe even a person that you know, has a higher, uh, the same level IQ or a higher IQ than you, but you have some very unique, creative way. You're, you're almost an artist with thought. So that's why they're interested in you. It's not about who's important or not important. It's about you do something weird with information that other people don't do. But Emily, it, so yeah, okay, so I am call it an artist with thought. Thank you, thank you. But anyway, so why... If I'm that unusual, why do they care about me? Because don't they want to grab onto what more people are doing so they can make patterns and map out trends? I mean, why do they pick somebody who doesn't do what most people are doing? Because they don't want people to necessarily be able to figure out or understand for the what exact they do. for the exact same reason that 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 um, 
Alpha computer, the AlphaGo computer did the move it did when it placed that piece on the far end of the board. Right. It's looking for the exceptional move. Right. You know, and so like, I'm thinking back to like the first time, one of the first uh, lectures I heard you give when you were really, uh, you know, talking about the nanotechnology, you know, and the chemtrails and stuff, or even like your Sandy Hook and 3, 4, and 5D kind of thing, right? Like you're not only analyzing what they're doing, but you're taking it a step farther and going, well, this could come next. And sometimes, Sophia, because they're not as smart as you, they haven't even thought of that yet. So sometimes, unbeknownst, you're even probably giving them an idea they haven't thought of yet. Well, that's not good. I, should be, <laughs> I, feel, I feel bad. Don't feel but bad. I understand what you're getting at. And that's yeah, very yeah. kind of complimentary of you. I, I swear that I don't know, you know, I only can do what I do. And I'm telling you something. I had a dream, too. And my dream the other night was so wild. It's now about three weeks. I actually had to wake up and write this dream down because it had so much science in it that I knew I was never going to be able to remember any of it. And... um now that dream has prompted me to start looking into bioelectricity or electron biology. But I'll tell you something. I maybe if I say what my dream is, they'll just run off, you know, like galloping horses with what I say. And so now I'm afraid to say it. So Let's see, they already this. know what your dream is. Okay, how do they know? Because I told because you that, that, that this is like this is where they're at with the technology is that they're actually able to view there is no privacy there is no surveillance we are there is i'm sorry there is there is no uh, there's no privacy there's no avoiding the cameras so avoiding being surveilled we're being surveilled from inside of our own minds and bodies let me pose something interesting because you just mentioned this dream in which there were science concepts are you a scientist sophia do you mean have I gone to a college and yeah, uh, do you have an advanced scientific background? No. Okay. So let's take that as the next, the next move on the go board. So the machines working on values of computational skill that outstrip a human being by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of clock cycles per second, the human brain calculates things on a certain scale most of it because of the way we're trained is linear unless you know you're trained in higher mathematics and you can work logarithmically and and algorithmically and then you have some computational advantages but you don't have a comp computational advantage over a machine that is programmed algorithmically however when you wake up from a dream with advanced scientific concepts that are not part of your normal everyday life, can we not say that you have stepped into a realm where pure knowledge has been imparted on some level or prompts or cues from, well, something else? The machine at that point does not have the ability to factor We'll call it a fourth dimensional computational system. But what you have done is you have tapped into the unconscious and pulled knowledge across your own knowledge base that you didn't previously have or that you didn't have cognition and awareness of working in on an active level. And this is where it gets interesting because we don't know right now what quantum computers mean. We don't have good working definitions for AI. But what we do understand is that human beings are multidimensional and operate in dream time in ways that there's no software programming language for 4D dream time. And there I just kind of dropped the bomb on the AI thing. 
Okay, so now I'm going to share with you some things that I've discovered about really sleeping in a profoundly healing and creative... Well, this is going to be good. I just got goosebumps. Go for it. (laughs) Okay. So, first of all, I sleep under a radio frequency shielding blanket. And it's a very simple thing. You buy some shielding fabric and you throw it over your bed and you sleep under it. And I like to sleep with my head under the covers when it's cold. I don't have a shortage of oxygen, unlike some people. And so I'm completely shielded under that. Mm. So I have no intrusion. Plus, I don't have wireless anything, okay? I don't have cordless phones. I don't have a cell phone next to my bed. I don't have Wi-Fi. So I'm getting complete parasympathetic nervous system operation. So for the listeners who aren't clear on what this is, the central nervous system is divided into two branches, the um, sympathetic and parasympathetic. It's actually part of the autonomic nervous system. So parasympathetic is your rest, digest, relax, and sleep mode. And sympathetic is your beta state of, oh, whoa, what's my schedule? Oh, my God, I have to look at my checkbook and balance it, or I have to do this at work, or it's the alert, and it includes fight or flight. And what radio frequencies do is they jolt and jar our bodies neurologically such that we're never able to retreat into or retire into parasympathetic nervous system operation. And we need to because sleep time, the reason you have to lie down and not move and not go anywhere is because your body is doing deep cellular restoration, rejuvenation and repairs. And it has to have you lying still in order to do all this. Plus, I read um, up on sleep recently and I realized, I mean, I'd read this before, but you know how it just sinks in when it sinks in? Uh-huh. That the different stages of sleep, there are five of them. In, in the deep stages of sleep, your brain is actually filtering and sorting through memories and events and discarding, quote unquote, the bad ones. So uh-huh. you are able to wake up with the important beneficial memories stored and the crap thrown out. And your body has done all its repairs. And so when you wake up, you go, oh, my gosh, I feel so amazing. I rested so well. So you're actually able to filter your the bad stuff when you're in parasympathetic mode and going through the proper cycles of sleep. And if you're in a wireless world, you can't do that. So no, you can't repair and you can't clean the garbage out of your mind. And so... I did a few things besides sleeping under the little blankie thing. And that's not the same blankie I have for this show. <laughs> okay. I have all different kinds. Um, um, I tilted my bed. Now, this is a very simple thing for people to do. I read about it. I heard about it through a I've friend. Heard this, yeah. yeah, I have too. Yes. All you have to do is go to the garage, get a couple of bricks, some cinder blocks, some books, and you raise the head end of your bed, not the foot part where the, you leave the bed, the feet of the bed at the bottom of the bed on the ground, and at the top end of the bed where your head is, you raise between five and seven inches. And so you're lying on a slope. And by lying on this slope, Not only are you really, really optimizing your circulation, which optimizes everything in the body, but you have, physiologically speaking, anatomically speaking, in musculoskeletal terms, you have what's called gentle traction. And this gravitational pull on your body, this slight five-degree angle, this slope, lying on a tilt like that, puts your body in alignment and you can feel it and it you have blood delivered to your toes your toes feel toasty and warm all night and that that kicks off the venous return there's hydro hydraulics involved in that um it all comes from the hydraulic venous return huh venous venous veins veins oh okay like veins i was like wow i was like we just i was like how did we just switch to astrology here no no venous return i got you okay 
Yeah. But your dreams become profound because you're now in the proper position to sleep. And I'll say that um, animals frequently sleep on hillsides. Mm -hmm. And when people go to the beach there and lie down in the sand, they're usually lying on a slight incline yep. because that's how the beach is. Yeah. So nature wants you to sleep at a five degree incline. And when you do that, that's when all of your systems are really operating in proper form. And that's what generates deep sleep and dreams. So these are very easy things to do. Yeah. In interesting. Do you... Um, hmm. So... I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't have, live in as, in as protected of a situation as you do because, you know, I do unplug my router at night and I have some things in my sleeping environment to sort of protect me from frequencies and whatnot. And, you know, sometimes occasionally I'll forget to turn the router off before I go to sleep and I will can definitely tell the difference in my quality of my sleep. I get what I call sort of synthetic or inserted kind of dreams and whatnot. But, you know, with what you know, I know you've done so much research into you know the bioelectrics and the piezoelectric crystal crystal structures in the body and all that kind of stuff do you not think that there is don't you think that there's enough sort of technology in our bodies and then all around us that a lot of this monitoring can be happening from inside of us regardless of that monitoring maybe emily but the alignment of the systems is something that that monitoring may not be able to affect. No, no, I, I, I get that. I agree with you. And I think that's a good idea to do that stuff anyway. But in terms of being able to, you were asking if they, you know, you know, about your dream, right? Like sometimes what I'm like intuiting or feeling like what is able to happen is that there's stuff out there that's able to almost upload or down, upload or pick up stuff off of things that are in our body. So the surveillance is actually happening from inside or the monitoring is happening from inside. And so I don't know that, you know, like it, it might not necessarily be happening at that moment when you're under the RFID blanket, right? But this stuff is in your body. But I get what you're saying about the alignment and all of this kind of stuff. I agree that whether you're in a uh, protected environment or not, sleeping in a position that it, it is best for your body to function will have a tremendous effect on the quality and quantity of sleep you get. Um, I was just still back on, on a certain level in that other space. Um, I know you have, you know, you, you create an environment for yourself that is probably super peaceful to sleep in. Maybe I should come spend the night sometime so I can actually get a good night's sleep. <laughs> but yeah, that's interesting about the bed though. I think I've heard that. I read an article about that, about the lifting the back of your bed. Yeah. It's very worth doing because it'll completely change everything about your body. And I have to say that, if you go to the website inclinedbedtherapy.com, a British engineer, Andrew Fletcher, put that website up after he determined that the there was a benefit to what he saw in the pharaoh's tombs. The pharaoh's beds mm -hmm. were tilted. And he started doing a lot of research into this. But, I mean, it, it corrects varicose veins, for God's sake. Wow. And sleep apnea and migraines and all kinds of benefits have been reported by people who've tried this. And once you do it, actually, I have to tell you something. A friend of mine tilted his bed. I managed to get him to do it after weeks and weeks and weeks of of barraging him with, have you done it? Have you done it? Oh, I'm too lazy. You would not believe how many people don't even want to try because the yeah. inertia is so immense in them. And um, anyway, so he did finally. And then he had to go and spend a week. He took a course or something like that. And he had to lie on a flat bed. And he came back and we were talking on the phone and he said, uh, I, when I was lying on that flat bed, it didn't feel right. In fact, it felt like it was declined. Yeah, leaning back, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. he said he didn't sleep properly and he couldn't wait to get back to his inclined bed. And so there you go, you know. The do, body do you, really appreciates it. Do you, do you and, sleep magnetic north as well? 
magnetic north. I actually sleep north, but yeah. I don't know that it's magnetic north. Maybe it is because yeah. there were several years that I slept in another direction and then I moved yeah. my bed and I've never moved it since. But anyway, my point is here that we, Emily and Randy, both of you know this, and because Randy, you brought it up a little while ago, that what human beings are capable of doing intuitively and creatively exceeds that of any machine, no matter how supercomputer-like it is. Yes. But we, we can operate optimally if we create the conditions. And whether the machines spy on us or not is one thing. But the fact that we can operate optimally is to our advantage because oh, that cha- yeah. yeah that changes your whole I, you could call it vibration and this is mm-hmm. what my dream was telling me my dream told me that we have a magnetic self mm-hmm. and that's not electromagnetic per se it doesn't mean that we're electromagnetic beings it's kind of on those lines but it said that the magnetic self responds to other magnetic fields, positive magnetic fields and negative magnetic fields. And I'm not using positive and negative in electrical terms. But, for instance, falling water and moving water has a positive magnetic field, meaning that it feels good, which is why people seek out waterfalls, which is why people will stand at a creek or a river and fish all day because moving water has a magnetic effect that is beneficial to us, right? Mm -hmm. Standing water, on the other hand, have you ever been by a pond that's overhung with creepy vines and it's just dank and stagnant and it's got moss all over it? That has a negative Mm -hmm. field, and standing water anywhere, if you go under a building and you see these these cisterns and culverts and gross standing water, you don't like it. So waves, ocean waves, even wind because there's moisture in the air, that is a positive magnetic effect and it connects to our magnetic self and it puts our magnetic self right side up. So does sunlight. Um, so we, it's really the, mach- the dream was telling me that we have to be aware on a constant basis of our magnetic self, which way mm-hmm. is it? And it told me that music speaks to and shifts our magnetic self. It'll either turn it right side up or upside down. Yep. Art, the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, people, our magnetic self is what gravitates toward the proper positive magnetic self of other people. Low intention on the part of you or someone else can flip your magnetic self upside down. And so the powers that be create anger and fear and low intention. And that turns us all upside down. And our magnetic self is inverted and we can't turn it right side up because there's so many forces around us that keep flipping it, flipping it, flipping it. So it's our job to take stock, to assess our magnetic self continually through the day and say, where's my magnetic self? Oh my gosh, it's upside down. I have to turn it right side up. Because the second you turn your magnetic self right side up, which can be by smiling at a stranger, I mean, it takes the simplest little things, you then change the vibe that goes out And that changes what comes back to you. Seriously, it's that simple. I I couldn't agree with you more, Sophia. I I, I absolutely completely on board with you about that. Yeah. And do you know what gave me this dream? This is what's so wild. So I wake up that night that I had this dream. I woke up at 3.50 in the morning. And I said, I'm having an incredible dream. I've got to write it down because I'll never remember all this. So I scrambled around for something to write with, and I grabbed an envelope and started, and then I realized, oh, it's raining. And I thought, rain wasn't in the forecast. So I went to the deck and opened the door, and I heard the rain. So I went out 
And I put my hand out into the night and there was no rain, but I heard it. So I went to the other end of the deck and I put my hand out, no rain. But I heard the rain and I thought, well, where is the rain if it's not falling on my hand? So I looked over the deck and I saw that beneath me, the sprinkler head on the ground was broken and the sprinkler was spraying 15 feet in the air and that was the moving water, the Mm -hmm. rain, right? So the moving water gave me the dream that contained the information about the moving magnetic field of moving water. That's what created the whole thing. Well, this fits into so many theories that we have. Yep. Yep. And listeners out there know, because we've talked about this, the things that happen with water and why we think water is, is a portal and that's how we access actual space. Um, interesting stuff. Wow. We're, we're right up on the top of the uh, hour here. And uh, so maybe we can find some way to maybe put a, a bow on this, this side and then move over to the Patreon side. Sophia, any thoughts you want to kind of round out here? Before we before we shift over, I mean, I kind of like sort of where we ended with this with this uh, you know magnetic self and the moving water. Yeah. Um, but is, was there kind of any? We kind of started in one place and ended up somewhere totally else. But that tends to happen when when you're having a conversation with someone who's interesting. So, anything you wanted to sort of circle back around to or round out before we switch over to the other segment? Yes, I want to remind the listeners. Because you're all great people. If you're even listening to this, apart from any perps or their (laughs) um, minions listening. Right. If you're listening because you want to listen, you are already a great person with tremendous potential, capacities, skills, talents. You have it all. And if you want to prevail over this AI machine world, I would say... Please tilt your bed, please. It's very difficult for people who have these wooden frames that their beds rest in. You've got to create some kind of plywood. You don't want to just jack up the head of your bed like some mattresses let you do, hospital beds let you do that. You want to be on a slope, a five degree slope, which translates to a minimum of five and a maximum of seven inches. And that is going to change your reality, I'm telling you. So that's what I'd like to finish on. All righty. Sounds good. And once again, Sophia, your website is sophiasmallstorm.com. You can go there and link to all of your uh, products and to how to sign up for your website, which is a snail mail kind of way, but all the information is there on your website, correct? Right. The newsletter you can access through sophiasmallstorm.com. There's a tab on the left. And then I would like to tell people that my store is avatarproducts.com. And that's where I share all the things I've discovered that have helped me in terms of my metabolism, biology. And they're very inexpensive, but I did a massive amount of um, sales. I was on Joe Imbriano, Fullerton Informer show, and I talked about iodine and magnesium. And I couldn't believe how many people responded and how many emails I got. So I would like all of you to just try iodine, magnesium, tilting your bed, and you will be amazed with a little tiny bit of expenditure. And it's not much. And tilting your bed is free. You're Mm -hmm. Whole, the pulse of everything that you're doing could completely change. All right. Well, that sounds good, everybody. Listen to Sophie. This is Off Planet Radio.